was a kid, I loved playing dominoes, but I'd never played dominoes. Not the one where you sit at a table with lay them flat and like match up the dots. I don't even know how that works. What I did was what you saw on the screen, not quite as fancy as that. I had about 500 dominoes in a couple of sets, and I would set them all up, like hundreds of dominoes, take hours to do it, and then the moment was so exciting when you just take that one, and there's like the one starting domino. Did anybody else do this? You know, the, the, and it's like when you push that one domino, if you did it right, it made that amazing sound, that, that kind of brrrr, kind of a sound, and they just start falling, falling, and they all fall over. One little push started a chain reaction. It was just amazing. Way more than that one little push. I believe that that's what it looks like when we're on a journey of spiritual growth. If you're a follower of Jesus or if you become a follower of Jesus, God invites you on this journey of, of becoming more like Jesus, of becoming who Jesus wants you to be. But it's not a one moment thing. When you come to the cross and confess your sins and receive Jesus, you become a child of God like the kids were just singing about. But the journey of growing up in faith is a lifelong journey. And so, so there's these different things we can do that will kind of like push one domino, one step of faithfulness, one, I believe there's small steps of spiritual growth, the sort of chain reaction that's way bigger than what we can do. The Holy Spirit sort of comes and fills the wind of our sails and our lives, and we take that one step of faithfulness, and he takes us further than we could go on our own. But it's a journey. I remember back, back about 13, 14 years ago, I wrote a book called Seismic Shifts. And the, the subtitle is The Little Changes That Make a Big Difference in Your Life. And I talked the publisher into putting dominoes on the cover. Because I said this, this whole book is going to be about the little steps we can take with God's word, with prayer, with worship, with generosity, with, with, with sharing our faith. The little steps we have the power to take and how God then starts a chain reaction that brings him glory. And, and I want to encourage you today, if you're a follower of Jesus... If you come to the cross and received him, that you would in a, in a fresh way say, God, show me that my journey of faith is continuing and blossoming and getting more and more wonderful. And if you're not yet a Christian, understand, being a Christian isn't just about coming and confessing your sins and receiving Jesus. That's part of it. But that's the beginning. And then God starts this beautiful process of transforming your life and making you a new person. And that happens, I believe, one Simple step at a time. Simple steps of choosing faithfulness. I was with a past, group of pastors recently, and one of the pastors asked me a real serious question. He said, and, and he, I knew what he meant when he said it. He said, does your church have a spiritual pathway for discipleship? Do you have a spiritual pathway for discipleship? What he meant was this. Do you have a program in place so that when somebody becomes a Christian... They know exactly, they, well, I know if I do this next, then I do this thing, and I do this thing, and, here's the, and, the, and I do each of these things, then I will grow more mature in my faith in Jesus. I knew that's what he meant. And I kind of asked a few questions and realized he was saying, do you have this set pathway? And I said, no. And he was kind of surprised. I said, we don't have a set pathway. I said, because here's the reality. We believe every person's different. And, and if you say, okay, we're all going to go full speed. Have you ever noticed, I was just, I was holding the door up here in the children's area because there was a husband and wife coming out of the children's area after dropping a child off. The husband walked out of the door and the wife was about halfway down the hallway. So I just stood there and waited. And she was moving at this pace and he was moving at this pace. And they eventually both got out and they might be in the worship center right now, I'm not sure. But, uh, but, but I, it just struck me. We move at different paces. We're different kinds of people. We have different needs for growth. For me, being in the scriptures and reading the Bible, that part of my spiritual growth happens very naturally. For my wife, being in prayer happens very naturally. She has to be more intentional about her growth in scripture. I have to be more intentional about my growth in prayer. We're different. And if, if Shoreline said, here's the pathway. Everyone do these things and follow this pathway at this pace, there's a very few people that will actually fit that flow. So I told this pastor who asked me, I said, well, actually what we do is we have hundreds of spiritual growth opportunities in our church. We teach children about Jesus in a certain way. We teach teens in a different way. We teach adults in a different way. We teach parents to help walk with their children in spiritual growth. We have Bible studies and classes. We don't have a pathway. We have all these different things, and we let people in our church find their pathway because we're all different. And we keep developing ways to help you forward on that journey. So today we're going to talk about the seven markers of spiritual maturity. These are the seven things that if you read this book from beginning to end, if you read God's word, and if you have your uh, bookmark that's in your bulletin here, you'll see all seven of the markers right there and the little pictures that represent each of them that we'll use at Shoreline when we're 
advertising a class or a learning experience if it's, it's around Bible engagement or passionate prayer. But, but if you read this book beginning to end, what you find is there's, there's seven kind of primary behaviors, activities, things we engage in that will propel us forward in spiritual growth. There's more than that, but these are the primary seven that we talk about that kind of help us understand how am I taking steps forward in spiritual growth. And so we're going to look at those, and we're going to think about them together, and also uh, we're going to direct you to an assessment tool that we've created here at Shoreline that actually allows you to do a self-assessment on our Shoreline app on your phone or on a computer, and we'll be sending you an email at 1 o'clock today with a link to all of this. Also, if you don't, can't find your way around your computer, you can just, it'll come in your email, you can click on it. It's a simple assessment tool. I did it yesterday in nine minutes. At the end of doing that, it immediately responded back with how I'm doing in all seven of the areas. And the point is not what number I get, what percentage I get. It's, it's which one am I lower in because I want to take, take some intentional steps to grow in the areas I need to grow more. And I hope you do too. So here's the seven areas. And with each of these, what I want you to see is there's little things we can do that propel us forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have to choose on a regular basis to take those simple steps. That's up to us. And when we do, the Holy Spirit then moves into us and takes us further than we were thinking about going. So here's the first one, Bible engagement. Our faith is growing deeper and richer when we are reading or listening to, some people love to listen to the Bible, that's fine. When we're reading or listening to, understanding and loving and following the teaching of the Bible. Because all of these come from the Bible, we're starting with that one. If you want to take steps forward in a spiritual journey of becoming more like Jesus and more who he wants you to be, engaging with the Bible is part of that. So we're taking steps forward. And some people, man, they're running full speed. Some people are taking first steps. But if you're a follower of Jesus, getting to know this book, loving what it says, receiving it, and acting on it is part of that journey. In the book of James, God by his spirit kind of puts it in this perspective so we can understand the importance of our actions that come out of God's word. In James 1.22, we read this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Let it change your life. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It's like looking in a mirror and seeing a big smudge Walking away and forgetting about it, going through your whole day, and having that big, he says, you see it, but you walk by and you just don't do anything about it. That's what's like reading the Bible and not taking action. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, God's word, that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. To know God's word is part of it. But there's people that have all kinds of Bible knowledge and it's not changing their heart or their life. So God, how do I take a little step and move forward acting on what you teach me from your word? So let me give you two what I call seismic shift suggestions. Two little steps you can start taking that would be transformational. Here's one. Find a daily accountability partner. Find someone who also wants to grow in reading God's word on a daily basis or every couple of days check in and say, hey, how have the last couple of days gone? And have someone keep you accountable to be in God's word. Well, yeah, but that would put pressure on me. <laughs> Not all bad. People become exercise partners. They become, you know, weight loss eating partners. They, talk, they have accountability in, all, in the workplace, in all kinds of areas of life. Why not in our spiritual growth? And, and so maybe, maybe you've, you've got somebody who's agreed, a friend or a family member, they're going to check in with you. And so it's been a couple of days since you talked to them, but you know they're going to say to you, you know, how's your time in God's word been the last couple of days? What have you, what have you been learning? So you, you, you haven't opened your Bible for three days and then you bump into them and they say, oh, hey, listen, tell me about your time in God's word. How are you doing in that routine of opening God's word every day? And you say, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm hanging in there. You know, I'm, I'm doing my... No, you say, I'm doing terrible. <laughs> I haven't opened my Bible for three days. That's accountability. And then they say, well, what's going on? Well, I got real busy. And then they kind of challenge you. And then you see them a couple days later and you've been opening the word and, and you share what God is teaching you. And you, and you share with honesty. You have somebody you can actually be honest with. And that helps inspire you to go forward. Here's another little thing you can do. A little suggestion. Use the daily shoreline reading plan. We've made a reading plan for every week of the year that gets you ready for the next Sunday sermon. So if, and it's on our website. It's in your bulletin. It's on the shoreline app. And if, you, if, you have your, if you're on your computer or your app and you 
Touch the day, it'll open the passage right there on your phone, your tablet, your computer. And if you hit the speaker, it'll actually read it to you. But get God's word in your heart. Get God's word in your mind. Make it a rhythm of your life. If we open God's word regularly, it's amazing. I, here's one of the challenges I give people sometimes. Just read the Bible five minutes a day. And a lot of people say, well, that's, that's not much of a challenge. Just start doing that. Because here's what happened. You start reading it, and God speaks to you, and you want more of it. And you start reading, and all of a sudden, 10 minutes went by, and you go, oh, I meant to only read five minutes, but I got so involved in God's word, and God's speaking to me, and I'm living out what it says. So that's one of the markers of spiritual growth. And when you see this, when you see this little picture on things with Shoreline, that little picture is going to be, that means this, this class or this thing I'm going to will grow me in my Bible engagement. Here's the second area of growth, a marker of spiritual growth, passionate prayer, passionate prayer. We are connecting with God and growing in faith when we pray often in many situations as we speak honestly to God one-on-one -on -one or with others and also seek to hear from God and follow his leading for our life. Prayer that becomes part of our lifestyle. That day by day I'm talking to God more, I'm listening for God more, I'm being responsive to God's leading by his Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, we read these words in verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. I look at it this way. <clears throat> if Jesus needed to get away and talk with the Father, I mean, how much more do I? How much more do we, right? Luke 9, 16 says this. This is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven... Jesus gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. Jesus gave thanks. He looked up to heaven and he said, God, thank you for your provision. Just in the flow of a normal day. <clears throat> Thanking God, talking to God, communing with God. How are you doing in growing as a person of prayer? Is it a thing I do when I'm at church? Is it a thing I do when I'm desperate? Or is it just this process of learning to talk with God day by day? If you do the, if you do the self assessment, and if and if your self assessment shows that one of your areas that you really need to grow is in this area of prayer, if you click on the link at the bottom of that, it'll open about fifty five or sixty different ways you can grow in prayer. Why fifty five or sixty? Because we're all different. Some are watch this YouTube video on prayer. Some are watch this sermon. Some are read this article. Some here's a book you could read. There's things actually for children, for parents to help children grow. And so if you click on that, it gives you all kinds of things. Well, and if you're like, well, tell me which things to do. Well, that's up for you to decide. Or if you click, I'd like to meet with a church leader, we'll meet with anyone in the church one-on-one -on -one and help you design your own spiritual pathway in the areas you most want to grow. And you're like, you'd take the time to sit with anyone in the church and help them kind of put together their own spiritual pathway? Absolutely, with you, as long as you participate. Because your path is different than someone else's. We don't have this, do these things and you'll be a mature Christian. Because I look at just my wife and I. There's certain areas I need to grow, other areas that I come more natural, so I focus on the areas I need the most growth in. She has different areas. We're not on the same path, but we're walking on the same journey towards Jesus. Are we following that? We're not doing exactly the same things, but we're working towards maturity, and that's where Jesus wants all of us to be. And so, prayer. So here's a couple of suggestions. How about this one? Praying the Lord's Prayer. Taking the Lord's Prayer from, from Matthew chapter 6, right in the Sermon on the Mount, and, and here's the key about the Lord's Prayer. If you've never memorized it, I'd encourage you to memorize it. But once you've memorized it, don't just quote it from memory. Jesus didn't mean for this prayer to be just to go, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, give us, give us you know, forgive us, and we're done. It's not that we just mindlessly say the words. The Lord's Prayer is to, is to propel us to talk to our God, our Father, my Father, Daddy, Thank you, God, that you watch over me like a loving father. Maybe my earthly father wasn't perfect, but you are perfect and you take care of me. Our father who art in heaven, God, you're beyond me. You're above me. You're powerful and glorious, but you're right here with me too. Hallowed be your name. God, you're holy. You are king of kings and Lord of lords. And let the prayer just propel you to all kinds of prayers. Don't just memorize the prayer, but let the prayer launch you into talking to the God who loves you. Maybe that's the next step in growth in prayer is learning to pray the Lord's prayer. Here's another one. Find what I call a trigger reminder. Things that happen through your day that can remind you to pray. Because we forget. We get busy. We get going. We get distracted. There's so much noise around us. But what if there were certain things that just kind of clicked and said, oh, I always pray when. For me, one of those is when I go by a church. 
If I go by a Christian church, I pray. If I know the pastor by name, I'll pray by name. If I don't, I'll say, Lord, bless their leaders, bless their church board, bless their congregation, bring revival, bring the power. And I just let it lead me into prayer. When I used to drive around the Midwest in Michigan, I'd pray a lot more because uh, there were churches everywhere. I mean, there's one road in, there in, in West Michigan that is in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most ch churches on one street in the world. But there's not as many church buildings around here, but, but when I see one, it leads me to pray. Here's another little trigger prayer. How about this? Brushing your teeth. How about every time you brush your teeth? Now, you have to pray quietly. Don't try to talk like, dear Jesus, you know, that's going to be hard when you're, but just in your mind, you know, pray. You know, and, and here's a good prayer to pray while you're brushing your teeth. God, guard my mouth. Keep me from gossip. Keep me from profanity. Keep me from being mean-spirited. Help me be kind. And every time you brush your teeth, so some of you like, that'll lead you to pray once a week. For some people, it leads you to pray like six times a day. You know, there's different people. You know, you got a different rhythm, but just maybe that's a trigger for you, right? How about every time I'm anxious, I pray. And a great prayer would be right out of Philippians 4, like 4 to 7 or so. You know, so, so it, it just talks about, you know, be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your requests be made known to God. Then it says, in the peace of God that passes all understanding, you know, will keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus, will guard your heart and your mind. What if you committed that to memory and then whenever you got anxious, you begin to pray that scripture? Some of you are like, if I prayed every time I'm anxious, I'd be praying like all day long. Okay, great. And you know what I think would happen? If every time you're anxious, if you start to pray and you start to quote the scripture out of Philippians chapter four, I think the enemy wants you to do a lot of things, but prayer isn't one of them. And I think your anxiety levels might start going down. If every time you felt anxious, you started to pray, that would be one tool you could use. How about every time you watch news, you'd pray for whoever the news is about? What if I don't like them? Pray for them. The Bible, the Bible says pray. Pray for people you like. Pray for people you don't like. Every time you see a news, you know, a news show, a news report, and there's somebody like, well, some of you watch a lot of news, you'd pray a lot. But let that move you to prayer. How about every time you eat a meal? People used to pray before meals. Did you know that? It's like a regular deal. We kind of dive in a lot now in our culture. But what if you slowed down and prayed? And what if every time you prayed, you thank God for what he gave you, but you also just prayed, Lord, there's also people around our community that don't have access to food like I do. I pray for them, and I pray you'd move my heart to help them where I can. It's one of the things we do in our church is help a lot of people in need. God may stir you to bring some food to our food pantry. God may stir you to help out and volunteer in some way. But every time I have a meal, I pray, thanking God, but also thinking of those who don't have all that I have. And each of those things becomes a little step that propels us forward. Here's a third area. And a third little symbol up on the screen there. Wholehearted worship. Lifting our hearts and our hands before the Lord. Our faith grows rich and strong as we learn to worship God passionately in community and spontaneously through the flow of an ordinary day from the depths of our heart. Worship when we're together and worship when you're just kind of going through your day. God, grow me as a person of worship, a person who's passionate and speaking to you and crying out to you in worship. In 1 Chronicles 16, there's this beautiful passage that calls us to worship. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. Boy, you know, worship out there in the world. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Notice the small g. Why? For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. How do I grow in worship? Well, here's one idea. How about you prepare for gathered worship? Every time, on every level. When you're going to meet with God's people on a night of worship, on a Wednesday, on a Sunday morning, what if you actually prepared for worship? That you, you, you say, I'm going I'm to get to bed on time on Saturday night so I'm fresh and awake. And if I stay up late, I'm coming to third service, but I'm going to be fresh and awake. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, but I want to come ready to worship. I'm going to prepare by saying, God, I want to sing with all my heart when we gather. I'm going to prepare by maybe doing the daily reading or, or preparing by looking at God's word, by coming a little early and sitting quietly. I'm going to prepare by planning to, 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 to give and to give joyfully. I'm going to, whether I go on my app, whether I do it on my computer, whether I do it in an offering plate, but I'm going, to, I'm going to prepare, Lord, I'm going to be part of that part of worship. I'm going to prepare to join, and when we pray, I'm not going to just be making a mental list of things to do later. I'm going to engage in worship. Prepare to worship. Prepare your heart. And then here's another, another wonderful way. It's a little thing you could do to grow as a worshiper. Infuse your day with great worship music. What if you said, throughout my day, I'm just going to bring worship music into what I do? 
If you have quiet time, if your earbuds in, you're listening to something, what are you listening to? And there's lots of great stuff out there, but, but I, I just try to bring worship music in through my day. And you say, well, what, what kind of worship music? I've got a couple of channels on YouTube that I just put on when I'm at my desk working, and I, play, and I put it up on one, my screen over here and leave it up there, and if it gets to the music I'm not interested in, I click back over and find something else, and it just, it just plays music. And, and so that's, that's, what if you say, well, I, I'd love to listen to some you know, classical, older hymns. And like, I, I, maybe you say, I love organ music. I love the old organ. And by the way, our organ's still in the shop. It'll be fixed soon. And we'll have it back set up here and we'll, okay, I'm just teasing you. Um, but, but you might say, I love the old hymns. I love organ music. Great. You can go online and, and just put in organ music, church hymns, and it'll play music for you all day long. I, I actually, I grew up not in the church, but I love the hymns. And so I, we don't sing a lot of them here. In the, most of them are hundreds of years old, but I love the hymns. And so I actually will sometimes put in my computer, I'll put in the two others. There's Fernando Ortega, this guitar player. I'll do hymns, Fernando Ortega. It's beautiful. Or this group called All Sons and Daughters. They're a the current group, and you do All Sons and Daughters hymns. It is beautiful. And I'll just go on the mix, put it on, and listen to hymns for hours sometimes. But, but bring music into your car and into your life that's worshiping Jesus, and that'll grow you. That's a little step you can take that'll propel you forward. There's more ideas on the website as well. Number four, humble service. Humble service. You know, to reach out and take a hand to help somebody else. We become more like Jesus and gain his perspective on life as we take daily steps into the practice of serving others. I love this passage from Mark chapter 10. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. And then Jesus points to himself. He calls himself the Son of Man. And Jesus says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I came to serve. And if you're going to follow me, grow in service. Part of growing as a Christian is day by day taking steps of growing and serving other people. So here's two seismic shift suggestions. First one is this. Try to commit to a daily service surprise. What if you made this decision? Every day of my life, I will serve one person by doing something that will surprise them. It could be a three-second service project, 30 seconds, three minutes, three hours, whatever it is. But every day I'm going to notice something that somebody wouldn't expect. And I'm going to say, can I help you with that? Can I I do that for you? And I'm going to offer a way to help. It could be in your home. It could be with roommates at school. It could be in your workplace. If you're in your workplace and there's something that's not your job and somebody else's job, and you just say, can I give you a hand with that? It means the world, and it grows you in Christ-likeness. And here's the second suggestion. A daily or regular discipline of service. Find one thing that's not really your responsibility and say, every day, I'm gonna do that one thing. And I encourage you to do it near the beginning of the day, and here's why. It'll set your tone for the day. Over 30 years ago, God called me to make the bed. Sherry sure doesn't like making the bed. That's my, that's, I took that over about 30 years ago. I make the bed. I put the blankets all ready. I put the quilt that you don't use on top of the quilt that you do use. I put the, three, the four pillows you can use and then the 18 pillows you can't use. I'm exactly right. And I, and I make the bed. And every day, I'm reminded, yeah, you might be a pastor, but before that, you make the bed. You make the sheets nice and smooth. And if Sherry's still asleep, sometimes I tuck her so tight, she's there when I get home at the end of the day, she can't know. <laughs> but, I, but I just, but that, you know, what's something you can do every single day? You don't have to do, but you can offer to do to bless someone else. And it just reminds you, this fundamentally what I am is I'm a Christian, and that means I serve people. And that would change the tone of your day and set the tone for your day. Number five, joyful generosity. Joyful generosity. This is part of our journey of spiritual growth, and we're taking steps toward that. Our heart and life reflects the presence of Jesus more clearly when we are progressively investing more of our resources into the things that delight the heart of God and doing this with increasing joy and excitement. You're saying God wants me to grow in generosity? Yes. And you're saying I'm supposed to be happy about it? (laughs) Yes. Yes increasingly generous and increasingly joyful as we walk toward Jesus. This is how Jesus put it in Matthew chapter six. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. 
Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love that little symbol we're using. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. It's to say, God, I'm giving you my heart. And when you give your heart, Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart is. You give him your heart, he has your, he has your stuff. So here's two little seismic shift suggestions. There's dozens more on the website. And there's, there's, you know, there's other ideas, but here's a couple thoughts in growing in joyful generosity. Here's number one. Declare God's stuff and mean it. What do I mean by that? Walk around your house, walk around your apartment, look, look around your trailer, wherever God's put you. Look at all that you have. Open your closet, look at your stuff. Go in your garage, look at what you have there. And you just go, God's stuff, God's stuff, God's stuff. This is God's stuff, God's stuff, God's stuff. But we're all in different places, right? So some people on joyful generosity, they're like, they're like I'm, on my journey, I'm like more back here, moving, I'm more back here, you know, moving this way, and I don't give. I don't give to anybody. I don't give to God. I don't give to, I don't give to church. It's all mine. And so maybe you go, okay, you walk in your garage, look at your car, and you go, my stuff, you know, my baby. Or you look at your things, you go, that, that's mine. It's, I have a few things, but they're mine. And say, God, no, let me learn to say it's, it's your stuff. And, and to live with open hands with all you've given to me. God, grow me in this. And I would encourage you just to look at what you have because if you can say, God, this is yours and I'm a steward who's taking care of what you've given to me but I live like this with everything in open hands. You know what I've discovered that God often does? You know who God gives more to oftentimes? Those who live with open hands because it can go through their hands to be a blessing to the world. But, but grow in that by saying it's God's stuff. And here's another challenge. Seismic shift suggestion. Take the next step toward joyful generosity. I don't know what your next step is. If you're in a place where you say, okay, here's where I am right now. I don't ever give to anyone or anything. Here's my challenge. Take a next step. Okay, once a month, I'm going to give something to a community ministry, to Shoreline, or to somebody else in need. I'm going to give something. I'm going to start there. How much? I don't know. It's your journey. But do something. Say, well, I occasionally do something. Okay, then make it regular. Say, okay, every week or every month, I'm going to do something. Well, I'm pretty consistent. I'm pretty regular. Then what's your next step? I don't know your next step. Uh, but I know that God keeps calling me to more generosity and to the right heart, a joyful generosity. And he's calling you to that as well if you're a follower of Jesus. Number six, consistent community. Consistent community. We grow stronger in faith and closer to Jesus when we connect regularly with his people in formal community and in daily natural interactions that are rich with the presence of our Savior. We grow when we connect with God's people. When we're not so busy doing our thing that we're together being God's people as a family. Hebrews chapter 10 says this. I love this challenge. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Challenge each other. You know, cheer each other on. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Encourage each other. Cheer each other on to become more like Jesus. So how do I connect more in community? Here's a couple of seismic shift suggestions. One is this. Find a group, class, community, or service opportunity. Find something happening at Shoreline. I don't know where to start. We have groups. We have classes. We have, have communities. We have service ministries. Get with other Christians. And enjoy spending time with them, just being together. And you're like, I don't like being around people very much. Let's stretch yourself a little bit. All of these, there's areas of all these seven that some of us are going to have a harder time with, but we say, God, grow me in this. And here's a second one, a second seismic shift suggestion. Enter early and linger longer. When you gather with other Christians, come five or ten minutes early. And put in your schedule to stay five or ten minutes afterwards. You say, well, but, but no, I come right at, when it starts and leave right when it ends because I don't want to interact with people. Well, that's the whole point of consistent community is learning to connect with God's people. Just come earlier and hang, but I'll feel awkward. Then press through it and just go, okay, I'm, and, and you're going to say, oh, here's a person I don't know. And you start having a conversation and, and God builds a friendship and starts to connect you in his body. Come a little early, linger longer. And again, on the website, there's lots of other ideas, but just to, there's little steps you can take that'll change everything. And number seven, Organic outreach, sharing our faith, the love of Jesus naturally. We are infused with the presence and passion of the Holy Spirit as we learn to share our stories of faith, his story of salvation, and live in ways that point to the resurrected and loving Savior. 
In Acts chapter one, Jesus, who's died on the cross at this point, he's raised from the dead, and he's showing up to his followers. He's talking to his followers, and he says this. It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right where you live, your hometown, Judea, the surrounding community, Samaria, the tough places most people avoid, and the ends of the earth, wherever God sends you. That's his call. Some of you are like, man, that's a hard one for me. I'm way back here in my journey. Then just take the next step. What's the next step? Well, on the website, there's lots of ideas. I'll share a couple of them, but just say, what's my next step? How do I begin to pray for people, love people, share the story of Jesus more naturally? So here's one idea, if you want to grow in that. Revival prayer. Commit yourself to pray, oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, bring revival in my heart, in my home, in my life. Bring revival in this community. Let people understand the love of Jesus in ways they never have before. Dare to pray that God will bring a fresh work of his spirit to our world because our world needs to know the love of Jesus. That's a great step into sharing your faith is praying for God to move in a powerful, fresh, new way. And then another seismic shift suggestion. Here's a little thing. Make time. In your schedule, in your normal week, make time to slow down and be with people who don't know that Jesus loves them. One of the best ways that God draws people to Jesus is just letting people who don't know Jesus' love hang out with people who love Jesus. And they realize they can have all these stereotypes in the media, but when they meet that person who loves Jesus, they go, well, you're pretty normal. You're pretty friendly. You're not you know, the mean-spirited, hateful person that I've been told by the media that you are. So I'm not like that. Actually, most of the Christians I know are. There's some Christians that are pretty mean, but most of them are really nice. You know? And, and, and just... Get connected with people. Make time. All of these seven areas, there's hundreds of ways we can take steps forward in growth. We try to provide a lot of ways here in the church, but here's one thing we're offering to you that I think will be incredibly helpful. Uh, at one o'clock today, you're gonna get an email. If you're in our database, if you're not, let us know. We'll put you in the database, and we won't spam you and send you lots of stuff. We'll just send you, uh, we use just one thing a week that we let you know what's going on in the church. But you're gonna get an email at one o'clock today. That's gonna, if you click on it, it'll go through the, the self-assessment of these seven areas. I did it yesterday, it took me nine minutes. And when I clicked on it, within about two seconds, I had all the results. And it gave, and it gave me, so if you look on the website, it's right there on the front of our website. If you have the Shoreline app, it's on the front page of the app right now. And if you get, if you get an email from Shoreline, you will get a notice today at one o'clock. You click on it, take your nine or 10 or 12 minutes, do the survey, it'll give you results right away. Now listen closely, if you click on the bottom where it says, I'd like to meet with somebody to talk about the results of my, my self-assessment, if you click there, then we'll get your information and we'll contact you. If you don't click on that, we have no idea who got what. It doesn't, we don't see any of that. But if you want to meet with somebody, we will meet with anybody in the whole church who wants to sit and kind of look at their pathway towards spiritual growth. No pressure, but it's totally available to you. And we'd be honored, we'd be honored to do that. So I encourage you to take time to do that. Take this. And just be reminded of those seven markers. And if you want to use the assessment tool, you can kind of know where you need to grow. And our prayer as a church is that every one of us at our own pace, on our own, we're, we're all on the same path toward Jesus growing in our faith, but the pace we move and the journey we take on that path, it's different. And we want to encourage you to take those steps of spiritual growth. And you take the little step and watch the big things that God does. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you that your Holy Spirit fills us with power to do what we can never do. Let us take our simple, small steps of faithfulness and fill the sails of our heart and our lives and propel us forward where we couldn't go. Lord, Lord help us to, to take the step, to hoist the sail, to be ready to see what you can do. Lord, I pray that every person who's gathered today here in the worship center, in the family worship venue, everybody who's online, that we will take steps forward in spiritual growth, that you'll lead us to places of deep love for you and deep spiritual maturity. And that we won't compare ourselves to anybody else or anyone else's pace. We'll become who you want us to be as we walk with you, Jesus. We pray this in your name, amen.